Okay, so t slavery and religion. <coughs> um, these, uh, this, we didn't set ourselves you know, with a very narrow or easily or focused uh, thing between these. These are two topics, I would say, of vast scope, both globally and also throughout time in human history. And so we're gonna have to narrow it in order to actually talk about this a little bit. I mean, the two of them together also have a considerable uh, amount of overlap and if we were to look at, for example, the one, we've always said before, we have a bunch of examples where when you take religion, um, there is a dividing line between formal organized religion and then some of these informal, customary, religious, spiritual, ritual activities that I guess aren't necessarily formal or organized religion, but maybe are in that same sphere. And so we've talked before about this. It's easy to take that formal religion and stick churches in there or mosques or temples or synagogues or gurdwaras. You can stick those all inside that pretty easily and draw the little dotted line about it. But then there's all these other things that people do, like crossing your fingers. <laughs> Knocking on wood, <laughs> celebrating Christmas. <laughs> I mean, it's got the word Christ in it. It doesn't mean that it's religious in a certain sense, but anyway, there's some, some things about it. Doing yoga. <coughs> um, yoga, it, it comes out of you know, religious tradition, even if a lot of practitioners of it in the West um, don't consider themselves what they're doing to be religious. She? Yeah. Yoga actually means to yoke yourself to a deity. To yoke, so there you go. So you're doing yoga. Well, you know, and Christmas means, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Participating in a wedding ceremony, right? Ceremonial. All of these symbolic things that you do, you know, your dad leads the daughter down an aisle holding, you know, giving, you know, her to the, to the guy. There's a white dress, you know, there's all these other kinds of things, flowers um, in the Western tradition. Uh, doing charity work. <laughs> going to a Raptors game. <laughs> I mean, we've seen that um, in past when we've looked at the history of this, um, all sporting events, all athletic competition were originally religious festivals, right? And lots of what happens still, um, it, it's almost, there's like very similar stuff that's happening at a Raptors game, <laughs> you know, as what's happening in ancient Rome at a chariot race where you know, the cities, you know, you have the different teams, the Reds and the Blues or something like that, and the cities, you know, absolutely is broken into factions about whether you're on the one side of the one or not. Um, and I don't know, you're doing everything still like the wave. <laughs> you're still interested when the ball's going. You still, you still do this sympathetic magic where everybody goes, oh, you know, because they want to make it. If you do this, then that'll make the ball go in, right? <laughs> There's all these things where you have to, you've, you've worn the one jersey, and that's when they won. So now you've been wearing that this entire year <laughs> so that they keep winning. And it worked. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Without washing the jersey. Without washing the jersey. Don't wash it. <laughs> Yeah, if you yeah, you have to do all of those kind of ritualistic activities. So what I want to kind of just say here is then religion is a bigger, foggier category or whatever than just the little thing that we sometimes like to draw inside this dotted line and put in a pen, right? Whoopsie, I'm going the wrong way now. Okay, this way. So the same thing is gonna be probably true with slavery, you know, as a topic. So on the one hand, when we had the uh, the picture uh, advertising this, we're really thinking, we're thinking of this formal definition of when it was legal, chattel slavery is the technical definition, we'll talk about that, or the technical term for it, not definition, and sometimes drawing the line between that and other oppressive practices that might be akin to slavery. Sometimes people, for some of these that are ongoing today, um, are called maybe neo-slavery or modern or 21st century slavery. So we know the one, and uh, when we think of it in our head, uh, historic or traditional or chattel slavery, but there's also, of course, human trafficking. There's debt bondage, forced labor that's ongoing that people experience. There's child labor, including things like child soldiers or forced or underage marriages. And maybe prison labor, right? So now that's also a thing. There's an amazing percentage, um, totally historically unprecedented percentage of the population of the United States is uh, is now incarcerated and and ever more of the people that are in these prisons you know are actually now um, 
in, in prison labor where they're essentially uncompensated for it. So, um, although this is not the topic of tonight's lecture, just to, we want to touch on this, um, this kind of neo-slavery or modern things that are akin to slavery. Uh, the Global Slavery Index um, uh, indicates anyway that 40 uh, million inhabitants, I'm sorry, individuals are currently trapped in some form of modern slavery. Um, according to them, the, the graphics that they put out, um, the prevalent, this is areas in the globe where there's the most prevalence of these kinds of um, modern slavery. Um, of these, 71% of the individuals trapped in modern slavery are female, 29% are male. There's some 100,000 or more child soldiers right now in the world. 15.4 million, especially girls, are in forced marriages. Uh, and then there's some 20. 4.9 million people in forced labor of some type or other. For example, um, debt bondage is apparently like very prevalent in, in South Asia, for example, where you have, you know, you have to you pay off even you can inherited debt that you can never get out of. So, um, so beyond those, though, I want to go to the, that inner cordon pen just so that we can kind of <coughs> narrow what we're talking about in this particular presentation. So we're going to look at some particular organized religions in, t in, in this case. This is a very vast topic, so we'll look at the West, we're gonna look at paganism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And we're going to look specifically at then at this kind of, not the current 21st century um, slavery, but especially ancient slavery, medieval um, serfdom that evolves out of ancient slavery, medieval slavery, and then modern slavery, all of which are connected to each other. And by modern, I use the term modern or anything that was after, after 1492. And so <laughs> that means, because I'm, I'm a medievalist, right? So anyway, <laughs> okay. So traditional slavery. Um, so illegal today in all the world's countries that are recognized, there are places where, um, that aren't recognized as countries, where it may not be the case. Traditional slavery, however, was legal in most societies until the 19th century. Um, it's also called chattel slavery because the people are considered to be chattel, which is word for personal property of a legal owner. I'm sorry, of a legal owner. Uh, so in this kind of slavery, chattel slavery, enslaved people are legally redefined as property that can be bought and sold. And indeed, um, the part of the whole idea of the system is dehumanizing the other, so that um, whereas in modern times now, we, we are very cognizant in saying things like enslaved people, enslaved persons, um, but the argument of people within the system and indeed their, their blind spot often of their paradigm and worldview um, is that the people who are enslaved aren't people at all and they do everything in their power to make themselves think that, right? Okay. So this kind of slavery, this traditional slavery, it's illegal in all the world's countries, as we say. So in what year did the last country to criminalize slavery do so? 1861. 1861, Elizabeth guesses. Anybody else? Shane? Early to mid 20th century. Early to mid 20th century. Any other guesses? The 1970s? 2007, thank you, Mauritania. <laughs> if you can imagine. Actually, 2010, Western Sahara, but it's not a, West, it's not a recognized country. <laughs> so, um, so Western Sahara uh, would be more recently even than this, but anyway, of, of the generally recognized countries, Mauritania, 2007, if you can imagine. <laughs> no, well, so criminalized for the people that are holding slaves. There's, those are the criminals in this case. So the slaves are not people who have been enslaved are not criminals. It's people who are enslaving other people who are, crim you know, are engaged in criminal activity um, globally now in every recognized country, right? I was so, thinking of Brazil. Yeah, yeah, so Elizabeth was thinking of Brazil. So yeah, there is in fact, um, what are you saying, 1888 here is where uh, Brazil then is. Uh, John, remember to use the clicker for the people oh, yeah, watching yeah. online. Yeah, I forgot I have my clicker, okay. <laughs> So here's a map. So we saw, so we were thinking of Brazil. So in the late 
1880s here, 1888, that's the end of slavery, the abolition of slavery in Brazil. You know, we had over here Mauritania. This is uh, the abolition of slavery in 1981. It's the criminalization of slavery is the 2007 thing in Mauritania. And Western Sahara, I point out here, is in 2010 is when they've criminalized um, slavery. So uh, the earliest um, uh, in this case in terms of abolishing slavery is in kind of in some of the northern European countries uh, and then East Asia, you know, as it's sort of spreading slowly into the modern era, abolition, but it's really quite recently that all of this has occurred. And I was starting to even think, you know, I mean, if we think about it even, you know, um, here where we're at, I mean, <laughs> 1865 is not that long ago. Sheen. Quick question, I'm looking at the, the map for the Nordic countries, and I'm just wondering that um, it says like, the medieval ages for them, but wouldn't, didn't they still continue to have slaves in their colonies? So, so the Vikings had slaves, but this is after the Vikings are gone, right? So this is, they get Christianized and they, and they um, what they've done here is abolish slaves. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you can't bring a slave to the country. <laughs> And so, um, and so in some of these, so this is the abolition of slavery. It's not the criminalization. I, what we had done in that previous thing, I didn't have a map for criminalization, so I wasn't able to find that. Um, so that thing with the, the 2007, that's criminalization. Um, so so I'll, we'll just have a couple examples of this. So in terms of abolition, this is an example of how this happened. So Louis X, the king of France, uh, in the late, well, in the early 14th century, he um, abolished slavery in France um, using the etymology of the word franc, which actually means free. He says France signifies freedom, and he also decreed that any slave setting foot in the kingdom would be freed. And so that's an early example of abolition. Um, but there's also economics behind this. <laughs> and so, um, so one of the things that had happened um, through the course of the Middle Ages um, is that, so whereas uh, in the late uh, Roman Empire, there were large populations of what um, were called slave, what we would now, we use the word slave in modern English. Latin, that is servi, so servant, servus, service. And so the, the servi um, acquire more and more um, rights and they become less slaves and they become more serfs. And so there ends up being in the, um, in the, in the West, in the Christian West, this population of what we think of peasants, serfs, who don't have all of the same, um, they don't have all of, they aren't subject to all the same things that a slave would be, but they are still not free because they are attached to property. So the difference between what we'll talk about chattel slavery where people can be bought and sold and serfdom, serfdom is you're part of the, the real estate. And so the, the, the property can be bought and sold and you're kind of like the, the house that's built on it. Because again, you're tied to the land and all your descendants and everything like that. So you owe certain obligations to the landowner. You're supposed to farm it on certain days. You maybe have rights to a certain portion of the harvest yourself and this kind of a thing. And so this is essentially what serfdom happened. And so, so by this point, essentially, um, the, uh, the French king is able to say slavery, which is this, uh, has evolved into a, is a slightly different practice than what they have in terms of serfdom. Um, we don't, we, we're abolishing. We're not going to allow that in, in France. Um, they're also fairly early on in getting rid of um, serfdom. And the reason for it, though, economically, as opposed to morally or religiously, um, is, is that when you have a um, uh, pop, huge population boom, and so the population of France in the 14th century, um, this is right before the Black Death, right? So it had grown to uh, 17 million. Uh, and so then when the Black Death hit in the middle of the century and, and a third or half of the people, uh, ultimately over the course of multiple uh, recurrences of the plague, uh, died, let's say like two thirds two-thirds survived ultimately, the population shrinks, then France's population didn't recover to um, uh, what it had been here in the central Middle Ages until like the 1700s or something like that. And so, and so as a result of that, what ends up happening is you only have so much land 
And if you start having all of these people, you can imagine that that depresses wages, right? And so, so the land becomes much more valuable than the people. And, you, and, and so if you have to do this thing where you have to raise a, a slave from baby and pay for you know, all of that cost, that isn't helping you one bit as a landowner. And so actually at a certain point throughout the Middle Ages and um, into the early modern times, noble landowners in Europe actually wanted to get rid of all of their serfs where humanly possible, and then by hook or by crook, however they could expel them from the land so that they could instead rent it out and things like that and get cash instead of just uh, having agricultural produce from their, from their tenants. David Foote says that demography can explain three quarters of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's well, a demographer, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and whereas I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to always say that economics are the only motivator. There's uh, often a very powerful motivator, and sometimes we can look at what the economic and demographic um, background to a story particularly is. And so this is certainly, you know, kind of part of the timing here of Northern and Western European early moves into this idea of abolition. They, they're abolishing slavery so that they could get you to pay rent. <laughs> Because <laughs> otherwise you, gotta, you, you get to live there for free as a serf, right? Okay. Okay, so despite then the fact that the word France <laughs> signifies freedom. So France, France does mean that. Nevertheless, um, uh, when France established itself as an overseas empire, so in the imperial age and the modern era, um, France, like uh, the other European powers, built that colonial empire on the backs of slave labor. Uh, and so... Colonial empires, if we just look at that same demographic or economic equation, have exactly the opposite issue in the labor um, equation and labor slash land equation, right? So when you go around with guns and, and cannons and boats and you just va steal vast tracts of land from indigenous peoples all around the entire planet, you have all the free land in the world, you know, but you don't have any people to do the labor. And so getting any French people to move uh, to Canada was almost impossible, which is why, you know, this is why the population of Canada was so small by the time of the French and Indian War, right? Uh, and so likewise, um, trying to get French people to move to uh, the West Indies, which was a much more valuable uh, French colony, uh, Haiti, for what's now Haiti, um, was, was actually quite difficult. They couldn't get the French people to go move there because you'd die of malaria and things like that. And so um, the landowners then uh, imported then slave labor, uh, because they didn't have any, I mean, that was their, uh, how they were able to exploit all of this free land that they had, right? So it's the complete opposite um, economic issue. Okay, so that's why I just bring this map back here again, so we can kind of see how this works economically. So in places that develop large populations early, um, you can see where that's where, um, you know, there's early abolition. China had a very early period of abolition, abolition too. It's just that it, it didn't take entirely. And so this is why this is a later abolition, but it also had a very early one. So some of those, oops. Anyway, some of that happens, whereas in places that um, are less developed economically and poorer, that's when these come, come later. Okay, so we had the year when slavery was finally criminalized everywhere. What year did slavery begin? Those are Sumerians. You can see the Sumerians there having slaves. Did they start it? <laughs> well, everything starts in Sumeria in terms of history, but in fact, we have to say a big old question mark in terms of history because slavery is a prehistoric institution. Slavery is well established in all um, historic ancient civilizations when they first become historic. So in other words, as soon as there begin to be written records anywhere, um, they already just kind of casually mention slavery as something that they just assume as a natural part of existence that they've had from time immemorial. They have no memory of it, it starting or any such thing. That's something that it was always was. So it's an inherited institution for historic civilizations. Um, as we've looked at it through anthropology and other kinds of things, archaeology, looking at um, hunter-gatherer remains and things like that, although slavery 
does in some rare circumstances exist in hunter-gatherer societies, it generally um, isn't very pronounced or widespread in these because you need to have, in order for slavery to be economically viable, you need to have both um, uh, economic surplus, so hunter-gatherers are pretty much hunting and gathering mostly for themselves and, and having a pretty good time at it usually, uh, comparatively, um, and whereas it, once you start in on agriculture, then you can, um, you know, to get a lot more immediate, you know, get a lot more surplus, and also you can concentrate population. And so, where there's a big concentration of population, where there's surpluses, then they can have slavery. So, with the invention and spread of agriculture in the Neolithic era, so this is again prehistoric times in the 7000s before the Common Era, slavery was already then widespread and therefore established when those societies become literate and start to give us records for the first time. And so I have here, for example, the uh, Code of Hammurabi, so the Babylonian, the ancient Babylonian law code from 1754 BCE. So it just includes, quite casually, mentions about slaves and slavery and things like that. There's not anything about, we just thought this thing up. <laughs> some of these people are going to be slaves now, isn't this a great idea, or anything like that. Rather, it's something that they have, right, and they're just simply talking about it. And so quite, and this is one of the very earliest uh, complete legal, complete texts we have of anything, certainly of like, things like a law code. Okay, so where do they get, people get slaves? So, um, <clears throat> all across the ancient world, but as we have recorded, for example, in the ancient Greeks, Homer, uh, other pre-classical authors from the oral tradition in ancient Greece, uh, they saw slavery as an inevitable consequence of war. So we, we have that um, phrase, to the victors go the spoils. So in this particular case, often when you're talking about a victor, you're not just plundering the people's property or taking over their land and their city and now it's your land and city. You are often also taking the person. Uh, yeah, Shaheen. That looks like the rape of Cassandra. Um, is it Cassandra? It's, it looks it like could her. be. Yeah, it does look like it. It, it looks like she's so holding it, 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 a statue did, of Athena. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, it's um, it's Ajax the Lesser, and uh, like you say, I think it's Cassandra. And so um, essentially, though, this is from Homer, right? Is the idea. So from the Iliad, this is a mythological scene, you know, of this idea though um, that these ancient Greek heroes could take as booty um, captured Trojan women who then are very clearly, they're not only slaves, but obviously sexual slaves. So that's um, one of the, the main components of, of slavery going all the way back to when history begins, right? And so, uh, yeah, she. Um, there is evidence to suggest that chimpanzees do this as well. Oh, um, so chimpanzees are known to wage war. They will go into neighboring territories where other chimp groups are, and they will kill them. They will kill the males, and they will take the females. Okay. Yeah. So when we say, you know, before, like we're talking about an inherited institution. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that people do, you know, that despite the fact that we in the modern and now postmodern era um, have inherited ideas like social contract theory from uh, modern philosophers, which more or less come up with this idea that individual um, cavemen are inventing things by you know, sitting around you know, doing a brainstorming session. Well, let's invent slavery now. Actually, most of these things that are things that they're doing before they have the capacity to think or talk about anything, right? And so these are you know, inherited from time immemorial. And so in, including this practice, right? But this practice is totally ingrained um, as far as the ancient Greeks are concerned in their heroic past uh, in, as it's described in, in Homer, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, so, uh, and this was continued to be contemporary practice for the ancient Greeks when they enter the historic times. And so one of the things that could happen is if you had, they had all these different city-states, and one of the things that could happen is that your city-state could go to war with another city-state, and, and if it wins, <laughs> potentially enslave the entire population. And so a very um, famous example of that is, in, again, in the, essentially in the prehistory, um, Sparta going to war you know, with its uh, neighboring uh, uh, city uh, and reducing them all to the status of being helots. 
uh, which is not the same ultimately, I didn't put this in a slide because it's actually a little complicated. So a helot, it, although is a kind of slave, it's actually also kind of a serf. And so as opposed to being a chattel slavery where helots, helots can't be sold, they're part of the land um, of the, uh, that, the, that the Spartans control through their kind of unique system. But essentially there would be, it would also be possible the, the citizens of Thebes, which is another one of the Greek city-states, also got conquered at one point, and then they all got subjected to be slavery, although the, it subjected to become slaves, enslaved, although they were liberated, and that was considered to be a big boon by the person who liberated them. So um, anyway, so that whole thing, you could, lose, you could lose the whole city, the whole game. Otherwise, it would happen is that you, could, uh, you simply would go to war. So Athens had this disastrous expedition to Sicily. Um, it's one of the major failures of the Athenian democracy. And when they lost, uh, the Sicilians took all of the Athenian troops that they captured or surrendered and sold them all into, into slavery. And so that's um, just how slavery would happen. So as the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus um, says when he's talking about it, war is the father of all, the king of all. He turns some people into slaves and he sets others free, right? So some people through revolt or revolution get away in terms of war from slavery, but a lot of others get enslaved uh, in antiquity. So what are the kind of conditions of slavery in antiquity? Um, throughout everywhere in the ancient world, just as everybody was mostly engaged in agriculture. Um, we are so removed from it now in our own uh, uh, world and time, we don't think about it, but a huge proportion of the entire population was engaged in agriculture. And indeed, that's where most of the slaves would be too. But uh, beyond doing agricultural work, which was the kind of work that everybody was doing, slaves were also singled out for particularly um, horrific uh, professions that included things like uh, being down in the mines, uh, which you don't have a very, um, long lifespan, generally speaking, if you're a mine worker, and, uh, and also being subject to brothels, um, especially really bad brothels. <laughs> so anyway, so those would tend to often be quite brutal conditions. Um, by contrast with the, um, though there was also, you know, at the other end of the spectrum of still the condition of uh, being a chattel slave, there would be slaves that had highly skilled trades, so there'd be everything from craftsmen to even bankers, um, who uh, to like domestic servants, they might live in actually relatively better conditions than let's say the poorest landless uh, peasants. So one of the things that happens in societies when there's um, massive power and uh, wealth inequality, uh, the people that are controlling the wealth, um, having access to them means that you also have access to like a lot more power, let's say, than if you're just in the big masses of people that don't have any power, right? And so if you, let's say, are the king's um, chief eunuch, you're an unfree person, you're a slave, you've been made a eunuch. In a lot of ways, this is a bad um, lot in life. Nevertheless, you're talking to the king every day. <laughs> you know, this is um, you know, actually Game of Thrones. It's like Lord Varys, right? And so there is Lord Varys because he, he ultimately did get killed. But a spoiler, I'm sorry <laughs> if you haven't seen that. But anyway, there is a, um, but you know, you are able to suggest a lot of things whispering into the king's ear. You may well be able to control so much more than you otherwise would. This is going to be true for, um, you know, house servants of nobles, you know, at a lower scale and that kind of a thing. And indeed, if you have um, a slave that has this particular skill or craft, um, that could be very valuable and make all kinds of income for, for whoever owns you. And so therefore be better treated than a mine slave for sure. Okay, so one of the um, you know, ironies is that on the one hand, while Athens, classical Athens was this innovator who is looked back upon uh, as you know, essentially the, one of these beginnings of democracy, it was also very much a slave society. And indeed, there were more slaves in ancient Athens than any other ancient Greek uh, city-state. And so, so maybe 80,000 slaves they had maybe, so about 30% of the population. Um, and apparently the majority of free Athenians at least owned one slave. And if you didn't own a slave, that was a real sign that you were a real poor Athenian. <laughs> you know, And so people pitied you a lot. Um, there's a guy named Lysias who um, has a, a discourse which he, in which he has a, 
a uh, poor Athenian who's become an invalid and who, uh, uh, who essentially is writing a, his complaint. And one of the characteristics, this isn't a real Athenian, but um, just as, a, as to it kind of just explain local expectations and, and social customs, the, the person complains, my income is very small now and I'm required to do uh, these things myself and I do not even have the means to purchase a slave who could do these things for me. So we have this poor person, you know, has to do all this, I don't know, combing their hair and stuff like that, that they would normally, you know, be able to have a, a slave do, right? Or, for example, in this case, the, you know, you're, you, you've, here you've gotten drunk, <laughs> you know, and, and you're, you, get, you have to, you know, you want to vomit, and the slave holds your hair for you and helps you get the bucket and that kind of a thing and picks up the vomit. So there's a, a, <laughs> a depiction of that, right? <laughs> so, anyway, if you're a poor Athenian, you don't have that. So it's so ubiquitous um, that then the philosophers began to conclude that it had to be part of the natural order of the universe. So in the politics, there are several developments up to this state, but Aristotle tends to put the big golden stamp on it here with um, writing in the politics. Uh, he that can foresee with his mind is naturally ruler and naturally master, and he that can do these things with his body is subject and naturally a slave. And so uh, he essentially creates a theory of natural slavery where uh, essentially the thinker is uh, like the philosopher kings. <laughs> These guys obviously should be uh, the natural masters. And if you're just um, essentially a physical laborer, you have a natural condition of being a, slavery as for, a slave as far as Aristotle's concerned, and as he goes on, uh, he argues that if you are then someone who is naturally uh, a slave, you might be able to comprehend reason, so you can, someone can tell you something you may be able to understand, unlike a dumb animal. Um, he nevertheless, uh, he says, that uh, natural slave has not the good, uh, has not got the deliberative part at all. So they, you can't be thinking of the ideas, you can maybe only be receptive of them. And so this is again part of the whole um, uh, Greek idea and Roman too, ancient idea especially of active and passive. And we'll talk about this in two weeks when we talk about um, Greek ideas and Roman ideas about homosexuality, but it also ultimately ends up figuring into um, a whole bunch of things. That, that, that's the undergirding for patriarchy. So um, one of the issues um, is that uh, throughout all of this, and I want, as I'm doing this entire lecture, as I was doing it, uh, all the reading for it, um, one of the other bits of overlap that we aren't getting to is um, the condition of, of women and the status of women often is also sort of intimately connected with this power structure. I mean, women aren't I mean, women are, as we see right now in terms of modern times, of all of the 40 million people enslaved, they were 70-some percent. Um, and, and likewise, um, uh, even in women constitute a large percentage of the slave population in antiquity. And women who weren't slaves, nevertheless, were subject to lots of the same sorts of controls um, uh, that slaves are in, in highly hierarchical societies that are undergirded by these, these kind of ideas, right? Okay, uh, so that's the background of slavery. Let's talk about slavery and religion. <laughs> so, so looking at slavery in the Hebrew Bible. So uh, one of the main things that we maybe think about in terms of the Hebrew Bible is we think of the, the fact that in the, in the origin story in Exodus of the Israelites, the Israelites are essentially coming out of Egypt having been enslaved and so in some sense um, there is the story of emancipation from slavery, so that slavery had been this bad condition for us, and now we have been freed, and we are our own people because of God's direct intervention. Nevertheless, although that is a central narrative of Exodus, the Hebrew Bible does not actually condemn or forbid slavery in more general terms. Um, so there are some prohibitions about um, enslaving fellow Israelites in Levitical law, in Torah, and there are rules for freeing enslaved Israelite men anyway, especially. Um, the biblical law treats slavery in ways that are actually very, very similar to other ancient law codes. So things like the Code of Hammurabi that we saw before would have been an earlier example, and this is a more, more recent example of, of those kind of law codes. 
So let's look at it a little bit. Uh, so from the book of Leviticus and Torah here, the Pentateuch, um, the holiness code, it here is, is uh, specifically uh, condoning or legalizing slave trade. So we read, as for the male and female slaves whom you may have, it is from the nations around you that you may acquire male and female slaves. So Gentiles, you can go ahead and, and acquire through war or however you're going to do it, a purchase. You can get male and female slaves. You may also acquire them from the aliens residing with you. So there are Canaanites and Midianites and things like that that live in the land with you. You can, you can make them your slaves. And from their families that are with you uh, who have been born in your land. Uh, and they may be your property. You may keep them as a possession for your children after you. So there you can send them an inheritance uh, for them to inherit as property. These you may treat as slaves, but as for your fellow Israelites, no one shall rule over the other with harshness. Okay, so um, in another portion of the law here in Exodus, um, the covenant code it's called, um, so you're to, you are to free your male Israelite slaves eventually, although there's a loophole that you can get out of it, uh, but you can also then keep any children uh, born into slavery permanently under certain circumstances. So let's read this one. So there, these are the ordinances that you shall set before them. When you buy a male Hebrew slave, so if you buy an Israelite who's already a slave, who's a male, he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year he shall go out a free person without debt. So essentially, this is essentially you're not supposed to keep um, uh, Israelite slave males as slaves um, for, you know, but you get to keep them for six years, right? <laughs> so uh, if he comes in single, so if he's unmarried, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, you know, while he, you know, if he, when he comes in, so he came in single and you got, and, he, and you gave him a wife, if you're the master, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. So the, those kids are slaves, you know, to, to be, as a inher property inherited according to Levitical law, or Exodus law, covenant code. Okay, goes on to say, here's the uh, way in which if you want to, if you can sell, want to sell your Israelite daughter into slavery, so when a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do, but if she uh, does not please her master who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to foreign, a foreign people since he has dealt unfairly with her. If he, desig if he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. You can see what, you know, what this kind of slavery is being used for, right? So this is concubinage, right? So sexual slavery. So if, you're using, if, you're, if the man who buys her is using her as, a, as his own concubine, this is what happens. But if, if he designates her as a son, it, that's a different circumstance. So, so if um, he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. And if he does not do these things for her, she shall go out without debt, without payment of money, right? So we can see um, there's a, I mean, I, there's a bunch of different ways for which um, this was this thing I was thinking about in terms of this crossover between slavery and just being a woman in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Um, the custom of marriage, although we have this idea of marriage as being, um, you know, founded on love and all these kind of things, in so many cases it's actually founded on on property rights and controlling patriarchy controlling bloodlines and, and all through the Middle Ages, so the Burgundian um, law, for example, uh, specifies uh, that when you are you're buying a, a wife, you know, you give the money to the, the dad and uh, the, at payment number one when the, on the wedding day, and then on the next morning, then you pay the, the residue, the rest that you owe, because the Burgundian law here is specifying as you're buying a wife uh, that you know she has to be a virgin, and so you would that's when you, the payment you tell on the next day, right? And so I mean that's all the way through to the through the Middle Ages, you know. Anyway, so these are anyway that's marriage. <laughs> okay, 
this though, even though, okay, this is maybe appalling to read this out of the Bible, um, this is actually quite though similar to all of the ancient neighbors. So the earliest parts of the Hebrew Bible, the stuff we're reading right here is written during the first temple period of ancient Judaism. So the sixth and fifth centuries before the common era. It's the Iron Age kingdom of Judah prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Solomon's temple. So Judah at this time, Iron Age Judah, like all of its contemporary neighbors practiced slavery. And you know, as appalling as these verses, uh, seem today the biblical law treats the institution uh, in ways that are very similar to all contemporary ancient legal codes. So it's not especially bad. It's bad, but the same bad. <laughs> okay, so fast forwarding a little bit. <laughs> what does Jesus have to say? So Jesus is a Jew of the second temple period. So some 500, 600 years later. Now, uh, at this point, Judea is a province in the Roman Empire or a client kingdom in certain parts of his life. Um, Jesus announced uh, in what he was talking about, a heavenly kingdom where the last would be first and the first would be last, teaching things like, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, which is to say he himself, Jesus, came not here, not to serve, I'm sorry, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that's um, at least attributed, words attributed to Jesus that are found in the canonical gospel of Matthew. So the idea anyway of the kingdom in this particular idea is that everybody's to be slaves or that the slaves anyway are to come first in the heavenly, <coughs> the kingdom of heaven, right? So Jesus also tells numerous parables about slaves. For example, this painting from the Renaissance is, indicate, is a depiction of Jesus. Um, a cent Roman centurion has come to Jesus and, and asked to have uh, his slave boy be healed. And so the healing occurs uh, at a distance. Jesus doesn't actually go to the household or anything like that. Um, but the Thing that interesting thing that happens here is that the Roman custom here of a centurion or whatever having a slave boy, I mean, is really you know um, also a indication of a you know a, a sexual relationship um, that Jesus doesn't do anything like in saying you must now free that boy or you shouldn't be doing this or anything like that. Just free the the um, it's just part of the background information here as the as the slave boy is freed. Um, so Jesus uses this uh, an, uh, relationship that exists ubiquitously in the background of Roman society of master and slaves as an analogy for the relationship between God and humans. Um, and so Christians then are envisioning themselves as slaves in these analogies, slaves to God uh, in this heavenly kingdom, a, king, a just kingdom as opposed to the Roman kingdom, Roman empire. Jesus himself promoted things like debt forgiveness, <coughs> So there is in, for example, um, uh, the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive those uh, who are indebted to us. And so in an agricultural um, peasant society like Jesus comes from, Galilee, uh, where everybody is essentially a, um, either a slave or a small agricultural worker, um, you get fairly quickly uh, into debt bondage which we talked about as something that is still ongoing, where essentially you um, might own your land, but because um, agriculture has got such fickle backgrounds, uh, cycles, you can have to borrow money in order to get uh, seed or something like that. And at a certain point, you are in, in debt bondage. And so having um, essentially a cancellation of debts is one way of alleviating a particular kind of slavery, but it's this debt slavery as opposed to chattel slavery, right? So it's not the stuff inside the dotted line that we were talking about before. So he has nowhere um, does he call for an ending of slavery in general. So that's not on, in, within um, the wheelhouse of anybody really in antiquity. Um, hardly anybody is, uh, imagines that such a thing is even possible. Uh, when Plato is envisioning utopia, uh, um, you know, his republic, there are slaves you know, in the republic. You know, when any of these theoretical um, even mythological lands. Uh, they, they think of the lands of um, uh, Caucania, it's called in the Middle Ages, Cuckoo Cloudland, and that, they make that in the, um, 
it's ancient. It's an ancient Greek idea, but it's uh, also in the Lego movie, right? So in Cuckoo Cloudland, um, there are slaves, you know, in the Cuckoo Cloudland because they just can't think of not having slaves, you know. So, so the birds have slaves in that in Cuckoo Cloudland. But anyway, so so Jesus is not calling for an end to slavery in general in in the Bible. So in the canonical Gospels, Jesus heals slaves, but he does not free them, right? In any kind of physical, literal sense, maybe he's freeing them in a Christian sense of some kind. Oh, but it gets worse, though. <laughs> so what does Paul have to say? So writing in the 50s and 60s, Paul of Tarsus is Christianity's earliest surviving author. He also penned the largest number of texts that made it into the canonical New Testament. So while Paul, at his best, promoted a community where there is, quote, neither slave nor free person because you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no longer Gentile or Greek, male or female. We're all one. Um, and anyway, especially here in this society of Rome, it was impossible to think of this, neither slave nor free. Nevertheless, he accepted the reality um, uh, that many members of the Christian community were legally slaves owned by other Christians. And that's something that he talks about a bunch of different places in his, in his letters. Um, so one of the um, occasions, the smallest book in the New Testament is a letter to Philemon. And um, uh, Paul writes to a Christian named Philemon who owns uh, this fugitive slave named uh, Onesimus. Uh, and so uh, Onesimus has actually run away from uh, his master, Philemon, and has been working with Paul as kind of a missionary companion, sort of a, a, it's probably like a freedman kind of servant relationship with Paul, um, although he's not actually technically a freedman because he's a fugitive slave. So Paul um, writes this letter where he is very circumspectly um, hinting to uh, uh, Philemon, hey, you really ought to free this guy <laughs> who's so helpful to me. Uh, because wouldn't that be really a boon to everybody and we, shouldn't we be freeing our fellow Christians and all these kind of things? And I'm kind of a big deal. I'm Paul and I could order you to do this, but I'm not. But I mean, wouldn't you want to do it? And, and then wouldn't it also be nice if we'd wrap this whole thing up in a bow if once you free him, you send him back to me so that he can continue to help me out here? <laughs> and that's kind of what, the, what that letter has. So whereas that, though there, that letter exists, Paul also, and Paul also counsels Christian masters to treat your slaves fairly and justly, but not that you have to free them or anything like that. He nevertheless repeatedly instructed, and there's multiple occasions, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with the sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. So there's lots of these slaves obey your masters lines, which um, Christian slave owners throughout history have been able to use to justify um, maintaining you know, the institution of slavery. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's just switching over to pre-Islamic Arabia. Um, again, like everywhere else, um, so pre-Islamic Arabia is the, now the late antiquity, the early Middle Ages. Um, uh, also, like all the rest of the ancient and medieval worlds, slavery is part of the society, right? So like Jesus, Muhammad lived in this slave-owning society and he interacts with slaves. There's all kinds of different anecdotal examples um, through uh, both in Quran and also the other traditions about Muhammad. There, one of the examples is this guy, Zaid, um, who as a young man was captured by raiders. Um, and this is one of the ways that everybody's enslaved. It's not just if your city goes to war and you um, get captured as part of a giant soldiering group. If you get on a boat and go on a trip, <laughs> pirates will come and attack your boat and everybody on the boat is now a slave, you know, on your boat. Uh, likewise, if you were ever traveling in antiquity, it's just amazingly dangerous to go uh, on a road or anything. Bandits capture you and now you're a slave. <laughs> uh, and this certainly happened to Zaid. And so um, he got got, gets taken to Mecca, somebody buys him, gives it as a gift to um, this woman, Khadija, who when she marries Muhammad and as a gift on their wedding, uh, as a wedding gift, she gives Zaid to Muhammad and he ultimately then frees Zaid and adopts him as a son in a ceremony. So even though he's actually older than Muhammad, um, he adopts him, I think he's 10 years older, I was reading, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, so it's, a, um, it's, a, uh, it's an example though of um, 
doing a good act, in other words, not Muhammad banishing or abolishing slavery, but showing by example uh, manumission, right? That it's a good deed to free, free slaves that you have. She. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, there is a, a, a surah in the Quran, Surah Al-Balad, which uh -huh. is the city that actually says that the, which is a reference to the, the steep pass of, of righteousness or steep or, or of goodness. And yeah, there we go. You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, we can. No, no, this isn't the one. Oh, that's no. the wrong one. No, this is not the one. Okay, um, I got the wrong one. Okay, surah, you can tell me the one. Yeah, so Surah Al-Balad, and it says the... And it says word for word, it's freeing of the slave uh -huh. is included in the things that you were supposed to do on this path of righteousness. No, and that's it's what, like that's a the steeper, one I just have. We'll get to is it. Is it the one? Sorry. Yeah. My I'll read it. it it's okay. We'll get to it. Yeah, exactly. No, there's a bunch of passages. So we'll get to those. Um, so the Quran, slavery and the Quran then. So um, just as the ancient Greek philosophers, uh, the Torah, Jesus, or the Christians took slavery as a given, the Quran likewise regulates rather than abolishes the practice. However, the Quran, like Paul, urges masters to be kind to their slaves and actually recommends their liberation by purchase or manumission. The freeing of slaves is recommended both if you want to get do expiation of your own sins, and so there's multiple surahs that are like that, or simply just it's a good thing to do. And there's multiple, actually, surahs that do that. Um, this is another example uh, Bilal here, who is an Ethiopian slave who uh, is emancipated on the instructions from Muhammad and then ultimately is, uh, becomes one of the first people to do the, how's, what's it called, Muazi? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay, so here's a couple of the verses. Yeah, this is the one you're Okay. And what will make you comprehend uh, what the up road, uphill road is? So there's two paths. There's one that's the one that's the road less taken, you know, and, but, and there's one that's the wide road that's the bad road, right? Or the wrong way. Um, so what's the, the uphill road? It is setting free of a slave. So if you're doing all of these benevolent things, and the first one on the list here is setting free a slave, giving food, giving uh, uh, the food of I'm sorry, the giving of food in a day of hunger to an orphan, having relationship, or to the poor man lying in the dust, then he is of those who believe and charge one another to show patience and charge one another to show compassion. These are the people of the right hand, and as for those who disbelieve in our communications, they are the people of the left hand, of them, uh, is fire closed over. So there's good things you can do, and the first one on the list that, he, that comes to mind is free slaves, right? Um, okay, and then, this is the one that I accidentally, I went too far, and okay, this is a different one. So also, though, so we have been talking about this idea of chattel slavery, where we are dehumanizing um, uh, the people who are enslaved and not considering them to be people, um, but the Quran is accepting that people are slaves, but they are still people who have uh, beliefs and also um, should be treated with kindness, right? So let those um, who do not find the means to marry keep chaste until Allah makes them free from want out of his grace. And as for those who ask for a writing from among those uh, whom your right hands possess, give them the writing if you know any good in them and give them of the wealth of Allah, which he has given you. And do not compel your slave girls to prostitution when they desire to keep chaste in order to seek the frail good of this world's life. And whoever compels them, then surely after their compulsion, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So it's a given in slavery. We, we should just mention all the way backwards and forwards. It's a given that when you have slave girls, and indeed when you have slave boys, um, uh, they're used for sexual uh, purposes. But what um, the Quran here is arguing is, uh, if they don't want to, <laughs> then, um, then you know, don't. And we're saying, don't do that. Um, and, but and if you do, <laughs> you know, uh, then God's going to forgive. That's not their fault. So God is quite merciful to them, right? Okay. So, um, kind of going forward. <laughs> so it, we now have not much time, and we're going to try to race forward to now, to the present, as we kind of set those kind of groundwork. 
So when we read in Torah, when we read in, in Leviticus and in Exodus, um, the Torah held out consideration for especially male Israelite slaves, but to some extent for the uh, female, the daughter is not really. <laughs> anyway, so in other words, in terms of when we're looking at slavery, there's a lot of idea that people don't like to sl enslave um, your own group. Um, so enslave Israelites, enslave the Gentiles. Likewise, um, uh, the Greeks at different times um, had, you know, didn't like, you know, at least foreigners to own Greek slaves, although at a certain point when the Romans owned every, you know, it did have a bunch of Greek slaves. Um, likewise, uh, medieval Muslims, Christians and Jews, attempted to avoid having slaves of their own religion or were counseled against it, or in a lot of cases there were rules and laws against it. Um, and so there were plenty of, um, uh, in the West, church councils that uh, forbid owning Christians as slaves, um, but that didn't forbid you from owning people who aren't Christians as slaves. Likewise, uh, Muslims had the same, uh, owning Muslim slaves, but you could have Christian slaves, uh, Jewish slaves, but um, especially then everybody also could all have pagan slaves, right? So you could have what they would consider at the time heathens or pagans. So anybody you could capture who isn't already a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, right? So in that same way that, um, for example, kind of famously, that prohibition on usury, so Christians can't um, charge interest on loans to other Christians according to canon law that was actually obeyed a little bit to some extent in the Middle Ages, which is why um, Jews, although Jews also can't charge interest on loan to other Jews, <laughs> according to, uh, you know, the, again, the, the rabbinic interpretation of the Levitical law and everything like that, what they could do was loan to each other, right? <laughs> And so because Jews represented a very small percentage of population throughout the Christian uh, world, uh, that, and because loaning money is so important uh, to just basic economy and, and everything like that, that became a specialized function uh, as you could loan to the other, right? Uh, you can't do it within your own community. And likewise, for example, the, uh, the idea of uh, doctrines and things like that of just wars. So medieval knights, you know, their entire function was going around, was fighting. It was understood to be that as a God-ordained function. And yet, going around and pillaging other Christians was viewed to be, um, you know, that people talked about it and they thought theoretically, well, that doesn't seem very good. <laughs> and so they, there was whole bunches of movements throughout the Central Middle Ages called the Truce of God, the Peace of God, trying to get knights um, not to just go around and plunder other Christians all the time. Um, it, that's not particularly successful, <laughs> but there was lots of church councils that forbade it. And the church then had this idea, well, what if we could get the knights to go attack other people <laughs> who aren't Christians? And, uh, and so the Crusades, right? And so, and other kinds of things like that. And that was, you know, anyway, somewhat effective. <laughs> but you can see that same, um, that same kind of thinking. Well, that same kind of thinking is also there for, for slavery. So um, prohibi prohibiting uh, enslaving co-religionists created then an economy for um, getting the others, right? And so um, in the Islamic world, um, there is a desire to get, you can get Christian slaves and then also uh, pagan or heathen, you know, people who aren't Christian, Muslim, or Jewish slaves, um, and then vice versa as well. So through the central uh, Middle Ages, um, in this period of time that is kind of like the Dark Ages as Western Europe is on its uh, lowest ebb in terms of demographically and economically and in terms of its power. This is like the, um, this is, uh, the, 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 the uh, ninth, ninth century, 10th century, ninth and 10th century. Essentially, the, um, Europe, Western Europe is kind of down to the northern bits of Spain, Italy, France, Germany, you know, um, and not the Scandinavia, the Britain, right? And so the Vikings are coming in and raiding uh, all the British Isles. They're settling in Normandy. Uh, they are raiding actually all the way around in up this way. One, one time, essentially, like the Vikings came all the way down and got a monastery this way, and they, the monks moved here, and then they, they got them all the way back <laughs> there the next day. Essentially, nowhere was safe, right? So that's happening, and so those guys are raiding up. And so what the, what the Vikings are doing is they have a less developed economy. They have a high, they have a high degree of military technology in terms of the boats are, are really quite good. 
Um, but essentially, um, the Christians have built all of these monasteries that are filled with treasures, and they don't have anybody protecting them in terms of troops. And so the, the Viking series just, whoa, this is free stuff everywhere. And so they grab all of that, and they also um, bring the monks and the other peasants and everything like back as slaves. So slavery is going back to there, and they're getting even more slaves from all across uh, the Slavonia, which is to say the Slavic territories, which is why we even have the word um, slave. So our word slave in English comes from the fact that so many Slavic people were enslaved at this time. Um, uh, likewise, the raids are coming here throughout the middle here from the Hungarians, the Magyars. Um, but in terms of raiding uh, down, so the Muslim world down here is much more uh, economically and otherwise, um, state-wise and everything else, politically sophisticated uh, at this point. And so they actually aren't getting, they aren't raiding uh, the Western Europe to get stuff. They are specifically raiding to get people, usually. And so um, some of the huge things of this, this time period, um, Southern Italy is just called, it's more or less said to be depopulated as uh, essentially the boats come and they fill up, uh, you know, they grab all the peasants, they just put them all the boat and then they take them back, you know? And so that's what um, people are essentially looking for. So you're either raiding up or raiding down depending on those things. And that's more or less now, uh, this is, pretty well the history going all the way back before that, but there's a special economy of it here um, for Christians and Muslims because you're trying not to um, enslave your own group, right? And so this sets up this dynamic that continues on all the way up through, um, you know, into modern times where uh, Christians and Muslims are, are, are raiding less developed places where, where people aren't Christian or Muslim, right? and bringing slaves back. Um, I want to make one little example here of an interesting, um, uh, another interesting quirk that happened. So in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, uh, the practice that Muslim rulers had of um, importing all of these non-Muslim slaves from areas like the Caucasus, so places like uh, Georgia and Abkhazia and that kind of thing, that area uh, between Russia and Persia, uh, from Turkmenistan, so the Central Asia, and then especially the, also the, from Slavic Europe, as we've said, is a major area of raiding, and bringing them back to um, the central uh, heartlands of the Islamic world, so the Levant, uh, Iraq, and uh, Egypt, um, led to the development of a very specialized institution of elite slaves, um, who are called Mamluk soldiers, or I think the word just means property, so in Arabic. But anyway, um, it's this idea that I was mentioning before, where if you actually, um, even though you're a slave, if you're actually connected right up with the um, the ruler, you might have a, a you know a much higher status than you uh, than just a regular poor person, right, who's technically free. So in this particular case. Uh, in order to have control, uh, the leaders, the sultans who are leaders or emirs who are leaders of these territories, in order to control their own populations or have armies to do all this kind of fighting, they um, imported boys, uh, foreign boys, Christians or pagans or heathens, uh, to become uh, a powerful uh, knight, uh, knightly caste. And so again, if you watched Game of Thrones and you've seen the, um, the Slaver's Bay that had those slave armies, you know, um, uh, this is the same kind of idea uh, where you um, bring in and trade, chain, train a um, kind of elite military caste who serves as the nucleus of, of, a, of a cavalry, an army. Uh, and this is especially true and happened in Egypt uh, where the Mamluks actually um, ultimately took over, took control in 1250 of the country and the leading Mamluk became the Sultan of Egypt. And then this um, completely foreign, so not, not Egyptian. I mean, the Egyptians have had uh, non-Egyptians rule them for a whole long time, but this was one of those, um, one of those long periods uh, where Mamluks continued to, they had to continue to import slave boys into the caste and the leadership you know, of, of the dynasty came from, um, again, that, ca that caste. And so that, they ruled Egypt as a major power, the, ma the most important power in the um, 
Muslim world for a few centuries. Then after 1517, when Ottoman Turkey uh, conquered Egypt, they nevertheless uh, continued to be the, the, the local guys on the ground that, the, that were subject to the, to the Ottoman sultans. So they were there through the 19th century. So it's kind of an amazing um, history. The, Muslim, the Ottomans then also um, went on to have their own system like this called the Janissary system where again they created their own kind of elite military of you know getting Christian Slavic slave boys as uh, as uh, you know into these kind of camps of, of soldier slaves and so it's a strange um, we think of boy the last thing you'd think you'd want to do is arm a bunch of slaves <laughs> uh, but it's a different kind of a, a system at that point okay so this same kind of thing like we had with the map with the uh, the Muslims and the Vikings, the same kind of raiding down then um, continues through the modern era um, and it goes all around. It's not simply Africa but obviously into the modern era the huge component of it is the African slave trade which continues um, in, in part in smaller numbers in the Islamic trade um, as slaves continue to be imported into Muslim countries from Africa but in much bigger numbers uh, in the West, in the Christian uh, imperial colonial places where slaves um, were quite famously, as we know, oh, I gotta use this thing, uh, imported into Virginia and the Americas, you know, which set up the stage for the American Civil War and uh, American racial problems and tensions all the way up to this day but actually vast numbers more into places like Brazil and especially the West Indies, which were um, economically uh, for the European colonial empires worth just oodles more. So all of North America, the colonies as far as, um, as, far as the British were concerned in the, in the 18th century um, were worth less than just a couple sugar islands <laughs> Uh, in the West Indies because the, the revenue that could be gained from these sugar plantations uh, was just staggering. Uh, but it was also, there's some, you see all of this transportation happening of all of these African slaves to those places because the mortality rates was also in those places so especially amazingly high. So, Elizabeth. Yeah, two things that I've read. One is that um, uh, the American Revolution was kind of the British gave up North America in order to keep the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, and the other is that the American, North American, United States slaver, the, the slaves, after a while they didn't have to import them anymore. They could dispense with the slave trade yes. because they reproduced. Right. But they didn't do that in the Caribbean and in Brazil. I'm not sure if this is part, I think this was partly because it was mostly men and not enough women, but it was also because they just worked them so hard yeah. that the women were not fertile. Yeah. And humans, we are a weed species we can reproduce in almost any circumstance. And if you consider as conditions where we cannot reproduce, my God. Yeah, yeah, and so this is something that um, has happened frequently in slave societies. So where the society gets very, very oppressive. So one of the reasons for the fall of the Western Roman Empire is because there was so much um, the slavery uh, that the large Roman landowners had, um, that the population just suffered kind of on, you know, an ongoing collapse. So by the time um, the West Roman Empire fell, there were just way less people there than there had been 300 years before that. Um, the same thing was true, so when we were talking before about ancient Greek slavery, uh, the Athenians were not breeding slaves. Uh, they were just, in, because um, they wouldn't let them even they wouldn't let them they <laughs> largely marry. yeah they couldn't marry and all that kind of thing and so in generally um, uh, because it actually is too expensive to raise the kids and that kind of thing compared to how easy it was to just go and capture a whole bunch of new slaves <laughs> and that and so anyway so that was um, you know part of the thing in terms of depopulation and so uh, yeah and so what that's 
you know, a part of what's happening here. <coughs> so as Elizabeth said, um, the British actually, in terms of financial calculus, losing North America in terms of overall crown revenues was almost nothing compared to keeping hold of, at the time, the sugar trade from the, from the West Indies. That calculus was done um, specifically, the French Empire made that. So if you're familiar with um, Napoleon uh, uh, in, um, selling Louisiana <laughs> to the United States, you know, this vast territory, so he, you know, um, you know, all, you know, almost this whole chunk of North America, technically the French Empire, sold. It's so that it was so that he could keep hold of Haiti. <laughs> because Haiti was so, you know, just amazingly valuable. Um, it was just, they put so much more into those and they got so much more out in terms of the colonial empire. So, I do want to conclude, <laughs> you know, in here in the end, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, in the course of this, obviously Christians and Muslims who are engaged in the slave trade. There were also many Christians and Muslims who opposed uh, this, both the slave trade and slavery, which led to abolitionism and the eventual abolition and now total abolition of all of this kind of traditional legal chattel slavery, obviously not the end to all kinds of um, human trafficking and new kinds of slavery that we have. But one of these specifically, these groups that um, can be singled out for special praise is the Quakers um, who stood up and were abolitionists very, very early on. This is just a picture of um, Henry Brown, who was a slave from Virginia, who mailed himself <laughs> to the abolitionists in Pennsylvania. Uh, so dressed a box, got in it, not nailed it, and uh, he was there for 27 hours by wagon steamboat until he arrived in Philadelphia. They opened it and like, he got away, <laughs> you know, from, from Virginia. Yeah. So, and so anyway, so through the course of that, uh, um, what I want to say, I guess, is that obviously um, all of these uh, religions that we've looked at, and actually the other religions of the world too, emerged in time periods when this institution, chattel slavery, you know, had existed and inherited from time immemorial, uh, largely, you know, the you know, what, what passed for, you know, the scientists, essentially the natural philosophers of the day that they relied on for understanding the physical world or natural world or how the world worked. Um, like Aristotle, you know, had decided and decreed this is just part of the natural order and nothing can be done about it. Um, and in a lot of sense, we think of all of these groups as being, let's say, new things. But in so many ways, um, these were all inheritances too. So in that sense, I'm not um, trying to excuse them, but it's also a way that we can see, um, anyway, how this context is interwoven, <coughs> um, and unfortunately how between uh, the groups uh, are internally um, fought on the one hand to maintain the practice and to, um, and to uh, you know, we saw it with the map, <laughs> expand it and have exploited it. On the other hand, we also have seen, the, we, there, there is also the story of how members of these groups also uh, helped to abolish it. Just a couple of uh, completely disparate notes. One is about the Quakers. It took 100 years for American Quakers to reach unity on the subject of slavery from a base basically from 1700 to 1800. And by that, only by that time uh, uh, were Quakers not allowed to own <coughs> slaves. If you were a Quaker and you had slaves and you did not free them, you were turfed out of your meeting. Okay. <laughs> and the other, I'm not sure how many people realize this, how the habits of deference and of fear last is uh, I think exemplified by the fact that Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama is most certainly an Ameri uh, African American. What he is not is the descendant of slaves. Mm. His children are, his, his children, wife yeah. is, but he is not. Well, in terms of the, you know, this evolving context. It took the Quakers a long time to get to the place where they were to take the forefront in the Underground Railroad and, and, and legal, the legal changes and abolition. Um, I can say that in our own tradition, uh, here in Community of Christ, the church that I'm a pastor of, so that we um, 
were founded in 1830, so right in the heart of when this was a, a big mess, and we were anticipating the end of the world very soon, and so people um, moved off to Missouri, from, well, mostly from New England, and they moved off to Missouri in order to um, build the New Jerusalem in Missouri. The local Missourians are, are um, very leery of these northerners, <laughs> um, and, and we kind of, in our newspaper, you know, um, published an article about, uh, you know, wanting to baptize free people of color and things like that. And the Missourians freaked out. They destroyed the paper press. <laughs> Ultimately, they kicked my, my ancestors, got kicked out of Missouri and everything like that. And, uh, um, and, and we moved to, got, anyway, moved to Illinois. But, and we weren't even abolitionists. <laughs> so in other words, so that was the kind of thing that can happen even when you weren't doing you know, what the, this bold stand that the, that the Quakers were doing, you, by just even talking about it, you know, um, uh, it, it, this was how charged it was. So. Um, I just wanted to make a point that it's not just religions that benefited or you know, sort of also propagated the institution of slavery, it's also science. Mm. And people do not realize just hu how huge of a debt science owes the modern slave trade. So a lot of, uh, you know, with the discovery of the Americas, a lot of the plants and animals that were brought back for cataloging to Europe were mm. brought on slave ships. And the naturalists and the botanists and the zoologists that sent out people on expeditions did so knowing that they were slavers. Wow. Well, that's what part of the story that I'm not as familiar with. Wow. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what kind of apology or compensation do you think it would be applicable or enough to leave the past behind? Yes. I'm not talking just about the atrocity against the African slaves. We also have here the First Nations. Yes. And we have lots of refugees in the world uh, from many other conflicts. Yes. But talking just about the African slaves, many people benefit from their uh, free work. Yeah. So how could we some, uh, at some point say, let's heal, leave the past behind, but let's make a proper compensation, a proper and genuine apology? What yeah. do you think would be enough? Yeah, um, the probably, I guess, I don't think that anything's ever enough because the a le level of um, setback is, is staggering and it goes on to this day, right? Um, I think that the a, attempt to address this, I mean, this isn't meant to be political. I can just say where, where my, my view um, was personally, um, I, I would have been very much in favor of the kinds of things that were, began to be done in the 1960s and 70s with affirmative action, because when you're in a system of um, inherited privilege and inherited um, uh, stigma and also disadvantage, um, there has to actually be you know, affirmative <laughs> Act actions on the parts of governments and other institutions in order to address these things. Um, one of the things that we've done in the case of, um, that I think is ongoing and just started in the case of First Nations as you're talking about is truth and reconciliation and some of the affirmative things that are being done. The problem with any, any of these, people tend to then, um, uh, there tends to be in the majority a, um, a, a reaction or a political reaction where people start to um, imagine that there's such a thing as reverse discrimination, which isn't a thing, uh, or special rights or any type of thing. Uh, rather, what we have to be aware of, or I think more cognizant of, is that, um, that there is all of this inheritance, um, and I certainly, myself, have uh, benefited massively from it by being a descendant of uh, European Americans for 14 generations. Um, and so all of these things that we are doing for truth and reconciliation and affirm affirmative action or any other thing need to be, we need to further them instead of say enough is enough or anything like that. That has to be ongoing, I think, in my view. 
And I don't know if that's not enough to even say, but anyway, also just be awareness of it. So that's one of the things that we're doing here is to try to get people to understand it. This isn't that long ago. We saw at the beginning of this, the, the, the legal thing ended in 2007, right? You know, that's as, this is as close it as it is, you know. Valerie has a comment or a question. Yeah, uh, if you could, John, if you could go back to that map that showed the um, modern era of slavery, just, you know, back in, yeah, that one. Um, another area in which, in effect, slavery existed was in uh, large parts of Eastern Europe, even unto Prussia, because um, a serfdom uh, had yeah. been continued as, a, as an economic uh, uh, kind of a condition uh, well past in Eastern Europe well past the time that uh, it had dissipated in Western Europe. Right. And uh, the condition of the serf in Eastern Europe deteriorated legally to the point where they in effect became slaves. They were bought and sold. Yeah. They, had, they had no freedom. And one of the reasons for that is that um, as uh, or the Russian Imperium was uh, uh, moving southward into the Black Sea area, for instance, well, and elsewhere, and pushing back the uh, the regime of, of the Ottomans, um, they uh, they were forming large um, estates yeah. that were in effect like like uh, American Southern plantations, yeah. and so they needed people to work those estates, but. But and they and they had as I said serfs, but the serfs tended to run away, so they yeah. legally bound them to the estates in, yeah. in in effect in in slavery, and then I'm thinking of other instances elsewhere in the world, like uh, in China they had corvée labor, which was, I, I mean where um, people were bound to work on large uh, infrastructure projects, like let's say the Great Wall of China, right, and that was in effect slavery and under horrible conditions, um, and then I'm thinking too that. When you think of the early parts of the Industrial Revolution and the condition under which people who had moved from rural areas into the big city, uh, the growing cities during the early oh, in, yeah. uh, industrial era, uh, how could it be said that you know, it, for most of the day oh, yeah. and most of the week they were not anything other than slaves? I mean, Absolutely. we use the term wage slaves, yeah. but they could hardly go anywhere else. Hunger and you know, the need to survive kept them bound to these horrible jobs where they were working 12, 14 hour days Absolutely. Uh, you know, for for a pittance, and you know, almost six, seven days a, a week. If, and uh, I'm thinking of you know Dickens and the Christmas oh, Carol, yeah. right? And you know, where you know even somebody who was a clerk was still had very precious little freedom to do whatever. Yep. Um, and there were worse jobs than that, coal mines, etc. And then two, I'm thinking uh, in the in the present day. Uh, there's a huge amount of slavery right now, uh, uh, you know, like the chocolate plantations in Africa, um, sex trafficking. I mean, there are slaves being held in Toronto right now, even as I speak. Yes. You know, sex trafficked women, people uh, brought in to do sweat, uh, sweatshop work who have, uh, whose passports are taken away and they, you know, they, they aren't go anywhere. Yep. So it's it's. I mean, know, ab I mean, absolutely. So yeah, this is. I mean, we talked to, at the very beginning. We talked about all of the other, you know, like how vast this topic of slavery-like yeah. things are. Yeah. Um, and because the topic is so enormous, and obviously uh, we don't want to only say that none of that, has, we, we, this is, uh, is ongoing and horrible, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it was only just in the course of, because the topic is so vast that we decided to limit the particular right, right, presentation right, right, yeah. to chattel yeah, slavery. Yeah. But I n in no way want to have come away here with the message, oh, isn't it nice that we solved this problem? <laughs> yeah. This is not, you know, this problem is not solved. There are ongoing um, conditions with everything that you've already talked about, as we've also talked about prison uh, labor, sure. all their kinds of forced labor, and again, the... Um, the problem of ongoing inheritance that you're, you're talking about. In other words, um, people who, ha that some groups have profited in, through inheritance by the labor of other people who have been disinherited because their labor, you know, uh, was, was they were, you know, they're descendants of slaves. So. Yeah. Yep. You know, two, two, two more uh, uh, things I was thinking. Children that were brought over as orphans from Britain Etc. Yeah, were in effect left in a condition of slavery, like on yeah, farms, the and, yeah. and also I think people who were indebted, yeah, uh, you know, forbidden were brought over, and in effect were slaves. Yep, yep. 
Valerie reminds me of uh, this movie that this documentary film that we watched uh, with uh, Gene at Eastminster United right. Church. I don't know, Gene, if you remember the name of these, this movie. Yeah, Gene runs a. Where's Gene? There he is. Yeah, uh, Gene runs a uh, cinema. Yeah, you can explain it. But we went and watched one about um, essentially slaves East and, and the agricultural uh, workers, yeah. or you know, oh yes, in, yeah, the, uh, um, in Ontario. Well, very close to home here, the yeah. uh, film called um, Migrant Dreams, which yeah. we showed a few months ago, and uh, and uh, it uh, makes quite a case uh, for many of the situations you're saying, that we, we uh, bring people from countries like uh, in, in Mexico and southern, southern American countries, Central American countries, to uh, the Niagara Peninsula primarily, and uh, uh, take away their passports, yeah. keep keep them in warehousing kind of situations, and uh, they are uh, in effect slaves yeah. to this thing. Uh, quick commercial <laughs> comment here: the, yeah. the film is made by Min Sook Lee, who is, uh, if anybody lives in Toronto, Danforth areas, I do, will be your federal NDP candidate in uh, the coming election. <laughs> so, uh, vote Min Sook. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I mean, and um, I don't know. So, so anyway, there's lots of this that we, you know, still can have as as a, you know, topics for future discussion. Um, one that I'm reminded of that you were talking about, even as a, so when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, there was a, a crazy practices that the university had in terms of bringing, especially South Asian Indian. Um, uh, graduate students in the math and sciences department, and if they they had to pay their own way over and all these kind of things, but they didn't have their um, their teaching appointments and all their funding and things like that guaranteed until after the university could decide whether it they um, people could under you know Americans could understand their English well enough, and so then they would cancel it, and the person would be left with all this debt uh, and have to go and have to go home, you know, where the 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 dollar exchange and everything like that. I mean, they put so, so much to be able to go to be in order to get paid pittance uh, as an international uh, TA anyway. But with the opportunity, potentially, if you if it, if you did go through all the different hurdles, you know, of winning, you know, of doing well. But anyway, so I remember. So anyway, as a graduate student, we all went on strike in order to protest those uh, conditions for what the university was yeah, doing. Yeah, I, 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 my, as I recollection of it is, is that we, they changed the policy a little. <laughs> so anyway, as a result of our strike. So June had a question or comment. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on modern day, modern day slavery. Um, so in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I worked in strip clubs in mm -hmm. Toronto. And the strip club owners had petitioned the government saying there weren't enough uh, like Canadian born women who are willing to do this job so they opened it up as a needed profession so that actually opened it up for people to come in and bring girls in and hold their pros their passports oh my goodness so it actually kind of like in a way the government was in a way encouraging this kind of behavior and i remember working in a club where one day it was like all these romanian girls came in and they're like oh yeah no no we're here but we have to earn so much and then we're free wow yeah <laughs> And that happened all across strip clubs, all across all across Toronto oh at that time. So there was like an influx of foreign workers, and a lot of them were on this system where it was like they had to pay back whatever whatever amount they right. paid to come over. Yeah, and they had to dance until they were through that. And some some people actually did it, like they paid it out, and like there's some of them are still in Toronto. But that's kind of like the whole system changed because because they'd lobbied the government to make it a needed profession. Wow. <laughs> Well, thank you, government. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and conclude. But, oh, unless, unless you wanted to say something urgent. No? You just grabbed the microphone back. Okay, very good. Well, anyway, so there's a lot, like I say, lots more we can discuss, and we can discuss more online or, or offline over snacks. And so we'll say that's it for now. And <laughs> thank you. Well, thank everybody who joined us online. And I'll let Leandro do the sign offs. Oh, there's one question. Oh, go ahead. Um, audience, uh, you guys can start getting snacks. We'll Monica <laughs> Taylor, do we know the earliest expression of the idea of chattel slavery as a moral evil? Chattel, uh, chattel slavery as a as a moral evil. I, 
I mean, I don't know about in terms of it being had the earliest expression of it where it's intrinsically so. Um, there is okay. So, the, so in the same way that um, I don't, I won't know outside of uh, outside of the West, but um, more familiar with ancient Greece. But in the same way that um, uh, there are ancient Greek philosophers that are on both sides of absolutely every question, <laughs> you know. So on the one hand. Uh, uh, you know, is there immortality, or you know, all of these different questions? You know, uh, is there such? You know, there is somebody who's opposing <coughs> Plato and Aristotle, right? Uh, for everything. Well, there's also somebody who um, was an ancient Greek thinker who, who's, wasn't as followed afterwards, who definitely um, came out against slavery as being completely unnatural. So, so that is also one of the contemporary thinkers. So, even though that wasn't the majority or mainstream philosophical thought. Um, it was definitely, as philosophers were on all sides of different questions and thinking about different things, um, uh, there was a proposal anyway that, uh, that one philosopher had, and I'm not remembering the particular philosopher's name, um, that did come out in opposition to slavery. So uh, I, that would might be one of the earliest examples of that that I'm aware of. Thank you. All right, and now it's next. <laughs> Thanks again.